podcast. This is our stay at home astronomy presentation and I'm Sarah Treadwell. And good evening. I'm Jeff Heberlein with the Rockford Amateur Astronomers too. Mm -hmm. And we're going to um, go over some just easy tips on how to do astronomy at home and some exciting new missions that are coming up with NASA. Um, so Jeff, do you want to talk just a little bit about the Solar System Ambassadors? He's yeah, Solar System Ambassadors is a group that is sponsored by NASA, by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we're a group of, uh, they have ambassadors in every state in the country, including Puerto Rico, as well as Washington, D.C., and uh, several Dominican Republic. And they're going actually to Germany, et cetera, now. And we have ambassadors that go out and talk to groups about upcoming space missions and the interest to try to show people what they get from space exploration and what we do to uh, broaden everybody's horizons and show different parts of what's going on in the solar system. So take it away, Sarah, it's all yours. Yeah, and I, um, I'm Sarah, but I go by a, a professional name called Space Case Sarah. Um, I communicate science uh, through a group called Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. Um, I was part of their young scientist program, and now I am a visiting scholar and I do science communication with them. And I also, through them, help produce a show called Ask an Astrobiologist, which is supported by NASA. Um, and this is just kind of what I do. I just love to talk about space, so I made it a brand. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk, like I said, how to do astronomy at home as low cost as possible. Um, and uh, I think something, Jeff, you wanted me to point out was I actually took this through my eyepiece of my telescope with my iPhone. So the technology to um, access astronomy is, is getting so easier and easier for people to access um, but we're going to talk about things that you don't need a telescope for. And then we're also going to talk about, and I'm so excited about this, we're going to talk about the next Mars rover Perseverance, which is landing this February 18th. And something I just want to note really quick that it is landing during the day, which is kind of unusual for a lot of um, missions. So this will be streamed live on NASA and, you know, it's an easy time for a lot of people to watch. So it's going to be really exciting. Um, so we're going to start with the easiest way to get into astronomy, which is kind of stating the obvious. Look up. <laughs> um, and Jeff, if you want to explain really quick what the what the scale is here. Yeah. Um, Actually, I, I thought this was a great thing. Um, this shows how with your being in different parts of the country, different areas of the like the city, you're going to see very different skies. Everybody has the same opportunity to look at the exact same sky. It's been the same for centuries. But we're depending on with your light pollution and where you live in, in your urban areas, you get cheated. And right now, uh, being in the Rockford area or an urban area like Belvedere or something, you're going to be basically at a six or seven, maybe a five if you're lucky. Um, there are places in like Los Angeles that the people basically see the moon and that's all they've ever seen. They don't know what else is going on. But you get out into the country, uh, you get out into what they call dark sites, which are in Utah and out in the big uh, um, Idaho, where you get out in the dark areas, uh, Nebraska, where there's nobody living. You start seeing threes, maybe four or three. You see more and more sky because there's no light pollution. Um, if you go out in the backyard and you've got all those outdoor backyard lights, you got farmers that have those lights in the backyard, you're going to be in a five and you're just not going to see a lot out there. Uh, it's out there, but we are living in basically a huge area of fog of light. Um, you get out into Australia, Antarctica, you see ones and twos. Um, the sky is spectacular. You just got to get away from light pollution. And uh, this is just a perfect way of, of showing it in one nice video where we're in a five or six, maybe a seven, you're really robbed. But you get out in the dark 
uh, especially when you're doing the meteor showers that we see there's 12 good meteor showers uh, throughout the year. You want to get out in an area where there's a three area where you're going to see those 100 meteors an hour, which they always talk about on the news. Whereas in Rockford, where you've got a good six, you might see three meteors in an hour. So that's yeah. a great way, the great video there, a great picture that, that Sarah got for us there. Yeah. And so, you know, it's a little discouraging. There are nonprofits, though, that are working towards um, pushing for better light technology for us to start to reduce um, this light pollution. And um, the more people that are interested in astronomy and, and get into this and push for this, the more we, we're going to be able to see this change. And, you know, we can definitely reverse this trend of light pollution. Um, but like Jeff said, if you're in Rockford, you're going to see probably about a six, um, maybe if you're really lucky, a five. Um, so one of the things I wanted to draw attention to is um, a lot of constellations can be seen at a six. Um, and an easy way to identify what constellations you can see uh, is to get one of these star wheels. These are really cheap on Amazon, but you can also print these online for free. And this is just sort of a calendar that will tell you what's visible at a certain time of year. So that's a good way to just start getting into astronomy is learning your constellations and learning what's out at what time of year. Um, and it's just, you know, I, it sounds silly that the easiest thing to do is to look up, but it really is your most accessible point of getting into astronomy is just looking up and seeing what you can see. Um, so my next suggestion for an easy way to get into astronomy, though, is to um, download this free website called, or um, it's not, it's an app also, but it's uh, it's free online. It's called Stellarium.org. You don't even have to download it. You can just look on it through a browser, and it is this really awesome, powerful, interactive website um, that just, it's it's so much fun. You can put in different coordinates around the world and look at constellations and what's up in the sky. And it, and it goes with real time. So I took this screenshot actually this past summer. So you can see um, Niaozi listed there. That was when the comet was passing by at that time. And um, one of my favorite things to point out about this also is there's definitely a social studies element that you can incorporate with this. If say you're a homeschooling parent or you're you know doing school at home right now, you can switch the cultures of the constellations. So you can say, look at what the Native Americans came up with for constellations. Um, and you can switch those and you can see the constellations shown and they'll tell you what culture that's representing. And so um, I've had a lot of fun with this and I know a lot of people really also like it. Um, so you can find it at stellarium.org. It's also an app. I think it's like maybe a couple of dollars to get the app. So that's my segue then into the next easy thing <laughs> is to get apps. And these are the two apps that I tend to use a lot. Um, on the bottom, the two bottom pictures, I have just a couple screenshots of Starwalk 2, which is very similar to Stellarium. Um, you basically just hold up your phone and it will tell you what your phone is pointing at, what you're seeing in the night sky. Um, so if you see in this picture, you see that little dashed yellow line that's actually the the path of the sun so it's just tracking there where the sun was rising and setting and it'll do similar things like that with the moon and with the planets um and it has it's just very visually pretty i didn't do very good justice with my screenshots but then um i also really like solar walk too it's just i mean it's just fun to navigate it um you can just look for anything. Uh, if you see in this picture, Voyager 1, which is one of the spacecrafts that are the farthest from Earth that we've ever sent anything. And it's somewhere way, way out there past Mars. But I have a picture there of Mars and you can look at each planet and cut it open and learn about its internal structure. Um, it's just really, they're like, even if you're not doing any outside observing, they're just very fun apps to play with. Um, just to even pull it up and be like, oh, what's out even in the daytime? Because there's always stars and planets out even in the daytime. And you can see where those are uh, at that exact moment where you are. So um, again, these are maybe like a dollar or two each. I can't remember what I paid for them, but they're really low cost. So much fun. Um, and uh, yeah, so 
Um, the other like very accessible and easy thing you can um, get involved with in astronomy and just space science in general is the copious amounts of resources NASA has online. Um, if you just Google NASA STEM, you can find activities from kindergarten age all the way up to you know adults. And um, one of the uh, the big picture I have here on the on the left is um, you can go to the Hubble site and put in uh, what it took on, you know, on this case, on August 1st in 2005, this is the picture that Hubble took that day. And so you can maybe go like, choose your birthday and see what Hubble took on your birthday. Um, and I think that honestly, I, I still am a little overwhelmed navigating it all because there's just been so many resources put out now since COVID started. And I, I know you've said the same thing, Jeff, like, there's just, there's just so much out there to get involved. They have projects and crafts right now. I know the solar systems are promoting um, a build your own rover. Uh, like, I don't know if it's a competition, but um, there's just tons and tons of things to watch and read and resources. And um, it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun. So there's tons to look at and play with there. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything from the solar system end on that with NASA resources. Uh, one of the neat resources that's out there, is, uh, definitely with the stellar, the Stellarium, is um, everybody's heard of this new SpaceX with the Starlink satellites. And everybody hears about seeing these trains of satellites out there. And that's always in the news. And everybody's like, well, how do I see these things? Uh, Stellarium, they have a fantastic part of that where you can look at the satellites flying through the sky. And you could actually go out and see satellites and it'll yeah. tell you a countdown as to when this one will be visible. The Hubble can be seen and you can actually go, hey, let's all wander out. And people find it amazing when you do a countdown and you say this is going to fly across the sky in three, two, one. And you watch yeah. this basically artificial star crossed over the heavens and everybody thinks that you're wow, you're impressive. Even the <laughs> guys answer you. The solarium. Uh, the NASA website with the eyes on the on the solar system, all of those give you access to be able to see all this neat stuff going on in the sky at night. So I'm really glad you threw that in there because it's cheap. I think the most expensive one is four bucks. So yeah. I think that won't break the bank and it'll give you hours of entertainment going out at night and, and looking at the night sky. So yeah. excellent. Glad you threw that in there. Yeah, and I think also now that you bring that up, I think my apps also um, you can set alerts that'll tell you if the International Space Station is passing by, and yep. it will say it'll tell you when when to go and where to look, which is always pretty neat. Um, just you know, it's just you know a little mind blowing to know that there are people literally on this little glowing light that just whoop, you know rushes right by you. So. Um, yeah, so those those are all I think really uh, easy ways to just not only um, learn more about astronomy, but you know um, get more acquainted so that when you do get out and start doing just observational astronomy with your own eyes, you're not completely lost in what you're looking at and where you're what you're trying to do. Um, and another um, really fun and free resource um, are these uh, micro observatory telescope networks. Um, so there are these cameras out west in very good dark sky areas, and you can go to these websites. This one I linked is with uh, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and you can um, select from a menu different um, galaxies or nebulas, or you can even do planets or easy to find things, and ask it to take a picture of it. And it will do that whenever it's available to do so. And then it will email the picture that it took. So it's it's a, a real picture it took for you by your request, um, which is 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 you know obviously situational to the weather and if something is visible at that time of year. But um, you know that's uh, you know even for uh, I have a couple of big telescopes. There are things that they can find that I. I simply cannot find with my telescopes. And so it's fun to just know that you're getting a real picture of a real galaxy that that took for you by your request. So I, I just think that that's a really fun, um, easy, available 
for free for anyone. So make sure you check those out because they're there uh there are some really fun names for different like nebulas and and galaxies and stuff um and sometimes in the past i've chosen some of them just purely out of i don't know haha -ha, like <laughs> i i keep bees and there's a beehive gal or a beehive nebula galaxy yep, but yep. um yeah and yes. uh so yeah and i so i'm just like oh i gotta do that because i'm obligated to do that <laughs> so um that said i think that that pretty much covers, I think, the really easy to access things at home. Um, and if you're interested in getting more into telescopes uh, or interested in, um, or even binoculars, um, Rockford Amateur Astronomers, who we are both affiliated with, can definitely, we can steer you in a direction uh, to get more serious into those um, kinds of equipment. So I have, I will mention uh, our contact info at the end, but now we're gonna shift to the Perseverance rover, um, which is going to be landing coming up very soon. So we have just a little video. We apologize, there's not gonna be any sound with it, but um, this is the mission trailer NASA actually released, I think less than a week ago for the Perseverance rover landing. So we're just gonna watch that quick. As it's playing, I wish there was the audio to it because it's excellent. No. But this is always, if you ever watch the news, they call it the seven minutes of terror yeah. because everything happens in seven minutes. And if anything goofs up, it becomes a crater <laughs> and yeah. it'll, it'll crash. Yeah. And so, you know, this is on YouTube. So just Google Perseverance Mission Trailer. You can hear the epic music. I can hear it. <laughs> but and it is, uh, it's, it's very epic. Area. But this is, yes, illustrating the seven minutes of terror, which we'll cover in just a little bit. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, sorry, sorry, forgot you had a great, great slide for that. So I jumped on. Yes, sorry yes. about that. Yeah. Ah. No, no, no worries. Oops. I don't want to play again. Let's keep going. So, um, yeah, seven minutes of terror. Uh, like I mentioned in my introduction, I uh, specifically uh, do a science communication a lot with astrobiology. And what's very cool about the Mars Perseverance rover is that's its primary mission and its goal. Um, and so I just wanted to touch really quick on what astrobiology is because I get asked more than I can count <laughs> what astrobiology is. And so I looked up the simple definition which is it's the branch of biology concerned with the study of life on earth and in space and if i can break that down a little bit easier to understand what that means is scientists study um very extreme spots on earth to see if there's life there and we've actually found life in places you could not even imagine it could have it could live in acid pools at the very bottom of the ocean underneath arctic ice and um so space is pretty extreme earth is pretty special <laughs> and because we can see that life can even live in these very extreme conditions it has pushed a search forward now to see if there can be life even out in our own solar system even though it's extreme we can see it happening on earth it could be happening elsewhere so perseverance is specifically going to mars because we know that Mars three billion years ago was a very wet planet and it could potentially harbor life. So it is going to look for signs of maybe ancient life that had existed at that time. So it's equipped with tons of really neat tools and it's just got lots of awesome new technology. And so that's what we're gonna, oh, no, I skipped too fast. <laughs> um, what Jeff was saying, the seven minutes of terror, what's really cool about this rover uh, is that it is actually equipped with internal maps and cameras. And so as it's descending down to its destination, it's going to scan the surface of Mars, compare it to the maps it has on board. And if it thinks that it's not heading in a good direction, it will be capable of thrusting itself in a different direction to get to a safer landing site. 
And this is the first time we've ever had technology like this to land a rover. Um, and just for reference, we've had um, four successful rovers landing before this. And this is the first time that we've been able to put this artificial self-driving intelligence onto a vehicle that we've been, you know, starting to incorporate into cars and, and uh, GPS navigation. Um, and also, I, I think that this always blows everybody's minds, but this is also the largest rover we've ever landed. It is the size of, uh, of a car. Um, I heard today that it weighs uh, a metric ton, so it's big. It's very ambitious um, and it's well equipped, but it doesn't make those seven minutes any less scary. So um, February 18th is going to be a very intense day for a lot of people. And uh, like I said, we won't know it in real time because it takes some time for uh, transmissions to relay back to earth, but um, it's gonna be covered live and as live as possible. So it'll be a very fun day to watch and, and learn about this next big step in astrobiology for NASA. Um, and one of the other cool things that we're putting on this for the first time is actually a, a little helicopter. Um, and the reason that this is really cool is because we have never put anything that could fly on another planet ever before. And, um, and it's, you, you would think that it's not that big of a deal, but there are a lot of challenges to putting something that can fly on another planet because we can't really test it on earth the way we could on another planet because the atmospheres are so different. So that lift that the helicopter uses from the air is very different on Mars than it is here. And um, Mars also has just, it, it, the dust is so fine, you know, and that can mess with the instrumentation. So um, this is a really cool new thing that I know NASA is very proud of too, that they're gonna be testing for many more future missions, exploring other moons of planets too. We're gonna use flying technology. So yeah. it's pretty exciting. Go ahead. No, I, I'm really glad, Sarah, you said that and you lined it up beautifully. You know, here on Earth, a lot of people know baseball. They go to baseball games and they're very impressed by, you know, Hank Aaron just died recently. And they talked about, you know, his, he was a home run hero. He could hit home runs amazingly. And on Earth, you know, a home run is 218 feet, once while 340 feet when these guys really slam that ball hard. Well, on Mars, because the air is so thin, you can easily hit a baseball. They're going to go 590, 620 feet. And they'll go almost double as far because the atmosphere is so thin and there's no resistance to it. So flying, flying on Mars is going to be a real trick. That helicopter is going to have to perform a lot better than it can here. And that's why I thought Sarah was great saying you can't test it here because our atmosphere is just so different that helicopter would it, 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 you can't du duplicate it there. Uh, yeah. So it's going to be really cool. And the atmosphere is just going to make it, if it flies at all, we're going to be proud of it. So, yeah, yeah, that's, and that's basically the point. And yeah, to your point, one of the scariest things about landing a rover or landing anything on Mars is actually the parachute, because we can't test the parachutes really as accurately as we would like on Earth. Um, and so, you know, that's a pretty important part about coming down yeah, is having yeah. a parachute that works. So um, yeah, it's, it's space is not easy. It's kind of a cliche thing that they say, but it's true. And the fact that we have, you know, we're gonna be landing a car on another planet basically um, is really incredible and a testament to how quickly we, ha quickly we have advanced technology over the matter of even my lifetime, you know, um, so. It's gonna be, I guess my point is, even if you aren't really into space science, this is gonna be a really cool mission to watch land. And it's not actually the only thing landing on Mars um, upcoming. There's gonna be two other, um, I think landers that are from, one is from China, I know for sure. So there's gonna be a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on. And this is all in preparation for the first person someday to walk on Mars and hopefully not that long from now. Um, so. Um, oh yeah, and I, I, ingenuity, there we go. I forgot I put that in there. <laughs> well, it'll be the first attempt to control flight on another planet. And that will also have self-guiding technology. So it will just automatically go back to perseverance. It, it will fly itself. We're not gonna direct it. 
Um, so we're not going to go over all the different cool things on Perseverance. There's a lot of cool stuff. Um, my favorite thing is Moxie, which is new, and we're going to try to see if we can make oxygen out of the carbon dioxide on Mars so that we can support human life on it down the road. Um, but it's just got tons of cool gadgets. And if you're into, you know, engineering and stuff, um, you know, you can go to like those uh, websites that I mentioned earlier, you can go and there's a 3D interactive model, you can look at this and click on all the different things and it'll tell you what it does. And, and it's going to be really neat. <laughs> and I actually heard today, Jeff, in the news briefing, um, one of the things they have two different uh, cameras, audio, audio capturing cameras. And what they want to do with one of those two cameras is take a laser and shoot at rocks so that they can hear what that laser sounds like bouncing off so they can tell what the the composition of the rocks are so mm -hmm. it's going to be huh. a new a new thing that's, we're trying that that's definitely new yeah yeah it's very cool um so i don't know you know this is sufficient right we can edit that part out <laughs> but that you know that was kind of what i had hoped we would cover um Jeff and I are both part of Rockford Amateur Astronomers. Right now, of course, we're closed because of COVID. But Jeff, do you want to talk really quick about what we have at the observatory for them? Yeah. You know, um, want to come? We have basically, okay, the club is the Rockford Amateur Astronomers. And we do run an observatory that is free to the general public. Uh, we're sponsored by the uh, Rockford Park District. And it's lo located out in Lockwood Park, which is out near Cyril's Park in the BMX tra uh, track. And we are open, beautiful, that was great. Uh, we do free <laughs> public nights every second and fourth Saturday. And we open about an hour after dark. Uh, so in the summertime, we don't open until almost nine o'clock. Wintertime, we're open about six o'clock. And we go from basically an hour after dark until everybody goes home. And uh, we try to look at our, our neck of the neighborhood and we do all the planets. And uh, we also watch uh, some of the dark sky activity that we can see from Rockford. Uh, but we meet on the second and fourth Saturday and we are free to the general public. Um, and hopefully soon uh, with COVID, we'll be able to welcome the general public out again. Uh, yeah. Right now, uh, we can't because we're all doing the same thing at the same telescopes. So that's, we can't do social distance that way. So, yeah, beautiful. Um, yeah, and, and I was gonna also say, we it, it, there is a dome with a very big telescope inside it. That's pretty special. It was built just for that club specifically. Yeah. Um, we have the and, second largest refractor in Illinois. It's a 10 inch astrophysics. And we've got a lot of other telescopes that range from 20 inches up to 20, an 18 inch uh, Dobsonium. So we, we've got some pretty good telescopes yeah, out there. And uh, we give you the opportunity to try them for free before laying down thousands of dollars to, to buy them yourself. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was going to say too, yeah, like, you know, you guys help show how they work. You'll help explain the differences between all of them. Because, you know, if you Google, what telescope should I buy? It can get overwhelming very quickly. Very quickly. Um, yeah, and uh, and yeah, it's you know, especially if you come in the summer, it's 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 just a relaxing place to be at night. Um, and yeah. and we would love to see people coming back when we can, because yeah. you know, it's just it's a great way to spend your summer evenings. Um, so, and then uh, one final plug for myself, I am Space Case Sarah. You can find me at spacecasesarah.com. I um, have been working really hard on a perseverance project with a couple other SciCommers, um, but I will be doing a lot of presentations going forward. And, uh, and, I'm, and I work very closely with lots of people affiliated with NASA. So I, I am always cooking up something. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and with that I'm going to end with the iconic blue marble. You know, thank you everyone. Remember that we are all planets, earth citizens, um and we should be kind to each other especially during these difficult times and you know, um there there's nothing more iconic that represents this one planet, one earth goal than the blue marble photograph. So, yeah. that's how I wanted to end it. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you.